Hi everyone, my name is Selena. Um, I'm a software, software engineer at Airbnb. And um, unlike many of the companies here that have been building API systems for years, Airbnb actually just begun its uh, migration from a monolithic application into a service, API-driven service-oriented architecture. So today, I'm going to talk about our migration journey, which will be packed with action instead of being restful, if you know what I mean. Um, cool. So let's go over the agenda first. I'll first talk about why, as a company, we decided to migrate to SOA. And then we'll use listing management app in our system, which is called Manager Space, as a, as a case study to illustrate our migration methodology. And then I'll share some building blocks that ensure the success of our migration. And then lastly, I'll talk about some results and share some lessons learned along the way. So to give you some context, back in the days, in 2008, Airbnb, like most small and scrappy startups, started out with a single web application built in Ruby on Rails. We ran really fast with it. We were, it was small, easy, um, fast to deploy, and fast to um, iterate upon. But over the years, we expanded into international markets. We um, started serving more and more hosts and guests around the world. Today, we have 6 million homes on Airbnb that spread across 81,000 cities. And we have 2.9 million hosts actively using our systems to manage their listing. So with um, such a growing scale um, of our business, we also need to grow our engineering team to be a thousand strong. With so many people working on a single web application, um, our app slowly became like a giant, fat, um, monolithic um, application. And because it's built on Rails internally, we called it the monorail. Um, with so many people jumping onto the train, it's becoming overloaded, very slow, um, unstable, and sometimes um, being the single so point of failure. So it's um, under this context that in 2018, our company decided to migrate our tech stack from the monolith to a service-oriented architecture, which is basically a network of loosely coupled services um, where each service handles a specific concern. And so the hope is that with such a structure, um, each team can build and deploy their services independently with faster deploy times and shorter iteration cycles. And we also hope to have clearer ownership around each product and service, um, which will hopefully lead to better collaboration among teams. So under um, this context, I guess, one of the core commitment is to migrate the manager space, which is our listing management product, into SOA. So what is manager space? Let's say this is Maria. She's a host um, based in Latin America. She's worked um, on improving her listing over the years, and she just earned her su first super host badge. And to account for her excellent services, she wants to increase her price a little bit. So what she will do is she will enter this URL, open the manager space app, which is, um, this is the laptop version. We also have iOS and native versions. And then she will navigate to the pricing tab, click edit to edit the listing price, set it to 60, click save. And now our system is updated with um, the new price. So this is just one feature um, of our app. There are a ton of other features such as, such as editing listing photos, adjusting minim minimum price, adding beds, you know, comply with regulations, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So how do we migrate such a huge and Harry app out of the monorail. Let's start with the architecture first. So first we have the external clients. They can be a laptop or a, a mobile devi device. And then we set up an API gateway that handles traffic routing and risk checks. And then for each major product or application, we have a presentation service that handles uh, most of the data um, that's um, to be returned back to the client. And they kind of encapsulate the logic of an end-user product experience um, for each um, application. And these services are the only ones that the API gateway should talk to. Behind these, we have a bunch of mid-tier services that's um, grouped around different business concerns, and they can be used in multiple contexts. And then behind those, we have data services that encapsulate multiple databases in, different, in a uniform data layer. So, of course, we interact with many other services in each tier every time we serve a request. 
And by the way, we decided to call our presentation service miso. It's a Japanese dish, it's very delicious, made of like soybean, um, scallions, and um, tofu. So yeah, that's a little bit of sidetrack. Um, so let's take um, a write request, for example. Say if the host wants to edit a listing title, the client will send a write request to MISO. MISO will then dispatch um, the request down to the validation service to validate the content of the write. And then the write will go straight down to the data service that persists the data in the database. Reads are similar, but slightly different. It will also hit um, our presentation service, MISO. But instead of going through the validation service, it will go straight to the data service to um, extract, extract the data and then hydrate back to the client. So that's the architecture. Now that we're done with the design, it's time to get our hands dirty in the actual migration process. It can be broken down into four broad steps, and the first one is scoping. And it's actually a lot like gardening. Um, so let's imagine for a moment that our app manager space is a giant, tall tree. Look at how messy it is. And notice all the leaves and the branches. Those are the components and attributes that we want to migrate. And then we also have to think about the ecosystem. For example, who uses the tree? So there you go, you have the Android bird and the iOS bird. Um, and sometimes it's also re really important to not only look up, but also look down to see what might be hidden underneath. And there you go, there's a dependency potato hidden underneath. You don't want to miss that. And lastly, it's also really important to take a step back and um, have a good look at the entire tree to uh, ident identify any opportunities for trimming, um, you know, to trim it down to a prettier shape. And that for us means deprecating any attributes that might not be relevant to our product anymore. So um, this step is really important because migration phase is a good time for us to get things right. And we definitely don't want to migrate any tech debt over. We want to build for the long term. So after we have determined what we want to migrate, it's time to actually migrate. Um, I want to highlight that the goal of our migration is to achieve feature parity with our existing monolithic application, which means we just want to migrate our um, existing logic as is without you know, adding any new product features into the mix. We want to take one step at a time. So let's start with a happy case. Um, so assuming we have all the downstream dependencies you know, extracted out of monorail um, and set up in the SOA world, all that there's left for us to do is to migrate our old logic from the monolith, which is built in Ruby, to our new service, which is built in Java. And for that, we build a magical transcompiler that um, translates the logic from one platform to another. But I'm really just kidding. It's the engineers who do the heavy lifting of migration. And I guess that's what we get paid for. Um, so that's the happy case. But things are not always that picture perfect. There's the not so happy case where you have some you know, straight bits, pieces of data and components that's just really hard to migrate out of the monorail. It takes a lot of effort, coordination, and whatever. So for in that scenario, we built a tool that wraps around our old monolith and which allows our services like MISO to talk to um, this monolith as if it's just another data service and to cherry pick data that it needs to hydrate its end response. So in this case, it's the photography status field that's um, getting hydrated from the monolith. So this calling, out, calling back to um, the monolith is not ideal, but sometimes it's necessary to help us unblock our progress. And if you think about it, it's more like a helpful scaffolding around um, the service that we're building and helps us achieve feature completion. And so after we have done all the hard work of migration, it's time to verify that our work is correct. Let's start with the read paths first. So the goal here is to make sure that for every request that we receive, um, we, the service that we have, MISO in this case, will return exactly the same response as our old uh, monolith. So um, we achieve this by doing something called shadow read, where we hook up both services to the API gateway, which replace traffic every time it receives a request um, to both the monolith and to our missile service. And then it will gather responses from both and perform offline comparison. So this setup is really neat because um, the comparison happens offline, which means that there's no performance implications for our end user. And the uh, traffic routing is also abstracted away on the API gateway layer. So that's read path. How about write paths? Um, first, I want to remind you again that for write paths, um, the write requests in the SOA world will go through MISO, the presentation service, first, 
and then make it make it make its way down to a write validation service that handles the burden of enforcing invariant constraints around each write request and validating them. And so writes are interesting because they have side effects. For example, let's take the pre-SOA um, production write request first. We have the request coming in um, to the gateway going through monorail and actually end up changing the production data. So let's think for a second what would happen if we um, adopt the same strategy for, um, as we did for um, read um, path comparison where we replay the traffic um, through our SOA services. So actually there's two ways things can go wrong here. First, because writes are not, um, writes are not item potent, it means that um, when we replay the traffic once through monorail and second time through MISO and the other SOA services, we might um, mess up the production data. And um, for example, we might end up list, uh, uploading a listing photo twice, and we don't want to do that. And second, if we have any mistakes in our migrated logic, we might also propagate the error down to the production data base and mess up production data, and that's not what we want. So we have to rethink our approach here. What we came up with is a dual write framework where we set up a separate end-to-end um, -end path with a separate database at the end of the path. And um, we actually will still um, replay the traffic here. For, uh, you can see the production traffic going through monorail and we'll replay the traffic through our SOA services, but this time the request will end up in a separate database that is a replica of the production database with some time lag. And then we'll configure both staging and production database to um, emit an event that's a snapshot of the database um, after each write. And those events will be ingested by this offline asynchronous database state comparison pipeline that you know, perform the audit and um, perform side-by-side -side mismatch um, um, detection on the data. So um, after all this hard work, we are production ready. As you can see here, this is like the in-between state. We have um, our fleet of SOA services lurking in the background, receiving shadow traffic, but actually running in production mode. And um, with a switch of um, you know, the traffic through the API gateway, we can easily replace the monolith with our SOA fleet. Here you can see the entire architecture. We have the writes going through MISO, ending up um, um, in the validation services and um, going to um, database all the way at the end. And then on the read side, we also have MISO hydrating from a dozen of downstream services um, directly. So, so far, I've only talked about challenges that's unique to um, migrating this listing management app out of the monolith, but there's also a set of common challenges that we face, and uh, it's, we are fortunate enough to have an infra team that provided us with a lot of building blocks that enable the success of our migration. So here, I'll share a few of them. First, we have an in-house API framework that allows us to define, define very clean and strongly typed API um, that allows all our internal services to communicate with each other. So let's say we have a fictional downstream service called Tofu, and let's say um, as part of the business logic, um, MISO has to read some data from Tofu. How this will happen is that we have to first define the Tofu API um, in Thrift inter, um, interface definition language. Here on the left, you can see that we have the response and request structs um, defined with some strong typing. And then on the, on the left side, you have the endpoint method, load some tofu with um, some custom annotations. Um, and so like this um, a API language really allows, allows for very clean and self-documenting API um, to be um, you know, defined. And at compile time, with just these few lines of code, um, a lot of convenience classes will be generated. Um, so let's first talk about the server classes on the tofu side. We have a bunch of auto-generated resource, um, endpoint resource classes that handles schema, um, schema validation, server transport, exception handling, et cetera. And then on MISO, the client side, we also have an auto-generated RPC client that's multi-threaded and handles payload validation and exception handling, request retries, and et cetera as well. And then on both sides, we also have a set of server-side and client-side metrics that allows us to you know, monitor the health of uh, inter-service communication. Um, and on top of this, we actually also built 
a custom API explorer that allows our engineers to browse through the APIs of our internal services um, with up-to-date schema. And um, additionally, we have a debugger that allows us to send um, um, like sample requests to experiment with the schema and not worry about you know, sending an outdated request because um, the schema is always up to date with the master branch. So it's actually Postman and curl, but better because we'll never have to spend hours figuring out why, our, why a request that worked earlier is not working anymore. And so with this set of productivity tools and the service um, API framework, um, our engineers can focus on just implementing the product business logic without worrying about you know, writing boilerplate code or worrying about the intricacies of inter-service communication. And then the second piece is Power Grid, which is a library built in-house um, by our infra team, and it helps us to execute tasks in parallel easily. So under the hood, we um, use the library to organize our code as a directed acyclic graph, where each node can be a task or function. And so we can model each of our service endpoint as a data flow with the request coming in as the input and the response um, being the output. And because it handles uh, multi-threading and concurrency, we can um, schedule our tasks to be run in parallel. So let's take um, listing activation, for example. We have to build a separate service for listing activation because um, as part of our business logic, every time we activate a listing, we have to perform a lot of risk checks. Um, and so, um, let's see, this is the endpoint data flow. We have the request coming in. First, we will extract the listing ID from the request, use it to fetch data to the listing service, and then we'll forward the data to a bunch of um, um, downstream, data, uh, downstream data services for validating um, whether this listing can be activated. Then we'll wait for um, all the green lights to um, return from all the services that's being run in parallel. Um, before actually writing to the listing service to activate a listing. So Power Grid is really um, handy in this case because it offers very granular metrics at the level of each node and helps us pinpoint whether a node is being the bottleneck of the entire data flow. And additionally, it really optimizes on IO operations that's running in parallel. And so that helps a lot with presentation services or validation services that has a lot of downstream dependencies. And then next is distributed tracing. Um, basically, every time um, a request comes into our system, our API gateway tags it with a unique tracing ID, and that allows us to track the entire life cycle of the request from start to finish, and allows us to pinpoint exactly where, how, or why a request has failed. Um, as you can see here is the, the flame, flame graph of a request, and you can see the red boxes highlighting the, where the error happened. Lastly, we have OneTouch. It's a tool and framework that's built upon Kubernetes that allows us to configure and deploy services easily. So this is something unique, perhaps not as common in other companies. At Airbnb, every engineer um, has to deploy services. We have a really strong DevOps culture, and so this tool is really important to us. There's two aspects to it. First is the philosophy that um, all co service configurations should live in one place in Git. And that means that we consolidate all our service configurations such as logging, alerts, dependencies, and um, deploy board stuff into this infrastructure uh, folder that lives right alongside the service um, source code folder. And there's also a bunch of um, sensible templates and defaults that's um, packed into it. Um, from a service governance perspective, it allows us to deploy and manage our services easily and to even diagnose if th there's anything wrong with the service upon startup. And the second aspect is a K tool that we use to de deploy our services. So let's say, for example, I want to deploy my missile app to the test environment. Um, on a co command line, I just have to type K all. Um, that will basically help to first generate the configurations, second, build the service, and third, deploy it to a remote cl uh, Kubernetes cluster. And it's actually, if you think about it, it's actually a lot like making a bowl of miso soup. First, you generate the bowl, um, that's the configurations, and then you build the soup that's like the meat of it. And lastly, you um, deploy all the ingredients, and there you go, that you have a test miso soup looking at you. 
and you can easily do the same for all the other environments. So you have like five bowls of miso soup ready for you to consume. Um, so yeah, that's the building blocks. Um, after like all, um, like all these like hoopla and stuff, we are ready to share some results. We have um, faster CI build time um, upon migrating to our SOA um, services. And we are also seeing faster deploy time. And that means the difference between five minutes and 20 minutes, which means a lot, of, a lot less context switching for engineers. We are also seeing um, uh, performance speed up for our MYS app. And we expect to see more um, when we focus more on the improvement. Um, and because we use a lot of out-of-the-box um, service frameworks that's provided by the infra team, we um, get a lot of dashboards and metrics for us to monitor the health and stability of our service, too. So lastly, some lessons learned along the way. Um, we think it's really important to invest in inf common infrastructure early on because it really helps to set um, the best practices for all product engineers to follow. And because everyone's on the same page using the same framework, um, it really helps to accelerate the pace of our migration. Secondly, we think it's okay to not replace the monolith all at once. Um, we want to perform incremental mi migration, which is safer, more stable, and less scary than you know, just replacing an entire app into a new world. And then first replicate, then redesign. For us, that means we want to migrate the old logic as it is, maybe deprecating some attributes, but mostly migrating the old logic into the new world without you know, introducing into the mix um, you know, new product features or like some crazy refactoring. You know? uh, migration is hard enough by itself. You don't want to complicate matters. And then lastly, I, we think it's really important to get your services to production as quickly as possible. Um, because it will help you to start treating errors and any alerts um, seriously from day one and really um, you know, maintain a high bar for the quality of your service in terms of resilience and stability. Um, that's really important because SOA is, if you think about it, it's a network of interconnected services. How your service is doing is going to impact your upstream and downstream services. And so um, you want to um, start um, um, maintaining your service seriously from day one and, and not jeopardize your entire ecosystem. So yeah, we think um, actually upon like migrating our tech stack from a monolithic application to uh, a service-oriented architecture, it's a lot easier for us to iterate on our product and to actually think about platformization. Um, for example, we can now support different types of listings, different tiers of um, offerings, for example, plus listings or lux listings. And then we can also support different kind of hosts, for example, pro hosts or co-hosts. And um, yeah, in that, in that way, we, um, we, we not only serve our end users um, with a better product experience, we also help our internal product engineers um, platformize and do some self-serve um, spin up of a new vertical more easily. So that's us. Thank you. A big applause to Selina. Thank you. And there's room for at least one question. Yeah, sure. One question over there. This is fast. Yeah. So I want to know what prompted Airbnb to start the switch if there was like a, because these cases they build over time and like the problems become bigger and bigger and they snowball, but sometimes there's a catalyzing event or um, something that finally makes the company want to make that migration. And so I was wondering if there was anything that finally made the decision very clear um, for Airbnb to switch. Right, I think um, it's a build up of all these factors over time. And I think um, finally like in 2018, there's like enough advocates and enough um, problems that really helps us to um, prioritize on the problem. Of course, we also need organizational, um, I guess, push from, you know, a sponsor from the leadership to, you know, push for this migration that's, you know, not actually pushing for, not actually contributing to growth, but more of like an internal refactoring. Um, I think one of the um, key problems that we face um, at the end of 2017 is just really long deploy train, like, um, an engineer developing on the monolith can wait for up to six hours for their change to be deployed to production, and that was really inefficient. Yeah. 
Thank you, Zelina. Thank you.